Adults, you can be turning to Romans 10. We're going to go back to our regularly scheduled programming (laughs) after Christmas as we look at Romans 10 this morning and continue on our study. We just got a few chapters left in Romans, and then we'll see where God leads after that. But, uh, man, what wonderful songs this morning that kind of go right along with our with our lesson, our message today, and it's so good to start the new year with you guys here this morning. You know, we, before Christmas, kind of bring you up to date, we, we've studied, and Paul kind of was talking about, you know, we all are sinners, we all are without excuse, we all need Jesus, uh, and then he talked about, you know, we, we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, the wages of sin is death, all those very familiar verses from Romans. And then it kind of like he took a break, and he took us to chapter 9 and now 10 and 11, and he's kind of like set this aside, and really, it really wasn't a break or really not out of place, it's just he wanted to talk to his people, and his people were the Israelites, the Jewish people, and they were still struggling, to say the least, with accepting Jesus as Savior. Their thing was, hey, they they were really into God, and they were really into all the things that God wanted them to do from the Old Testament. And they had been preparing, as we'll see this morning, they'd been looking forward to the Messiah coming. But they just couldn't accept that this old rugged guy from Nazareth was their Messiah. And they sure couldn't accept that this was the Son of God. And so, in chapter 9, we've seen where he was kind of talking about their past. And now he's really kind of hitting them head on in chapter 10 of where they are right now. And there are so much similarities into where we are and where our country is and, and all those things as we look at chapter 10 and how mankind is. Mankind's still trying to figure this Jesus thing out. Is it really real? Does it really make a difference? Is, it, is there really a God out there to begin with? Is there a master designer? All these questions that you deal with at, in your families, at your workplace, and, and sometimes in our own heart, trying to understand God's Word a little bit more. He kind of left them and let them into this theme of righteousness there at the end of 9. That's where I wanted to pick up with. And just back up just a few verses there if you got your Bible open into chapter 9. But he said, what then shall we say? That the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it, a righteousness that is by faith. But the people of Israel who pursued the law as the way of righteousness have not attained their goal. And you can kind of see there the difference that, that... He's battling with his own people. He said, look, you're trying to obtain heaven. You're trying to obtain righteousness through the law, through keeping the commandments, through all these other things you've added. And some people say they had over 600 different laws that they had added to the original 10 where they could really put the pressure on people that, look, I kept more laws than you did this week. I'm closer to God than you are. And they really struggled with that. And we kind of still struggle with that today, to be honest with you. I I came to church and you didn't, or I I took somebody some food and you didn't, or, you know, we we kind of like to get our marks on the the blackboard up here. And I told the kids this morning in our teen classes, I said, look, guys, there's none of us going to be in heaven because we've got a whole bunch of check marks on on the chalkboard of heaven. We're going to be in heaven by the blood of Jesus Christ and his righteousness. And there's no other way. And the Israelites just couldn't grasp that. They, they thought they had to earn it. They had to work at it. And guys, don't get me wrong. Once we know Jesus the Savior, do we want to live for him? You better believe it. Do we want to do good works for him? You better believe it. But we do that because of, not to gain heaven. We do that because of what God has done for us. And that's what he's telling them here. He said the Gentiles have, are getting it because they don't have this, this old root that they're trying to get around. The Gentiles are just believing by faith that this was God's Son, Jesus Christ. And he said, they're coming to know Jesus. They're coming to know him as Savior, but you guys are still struggling. Verse 32, why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if that were by works. He's talking about the Jews. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. The thing that they have been praying for and hoping for and reading back in Numbers and and Psalms, and and all the books of law, and all those prophecies that were foretold of this little baby being born, they they just stumbled right over it. They'd been looking for it for so long, 
Here he was standing right in front of them, and they just put him to death. That's all they could do. That's, that's all they could figure out was let's just crucify him. He's, he can't be what we're looking for. And you know, today, in today's world, there's a whole lot of people trying to make God what they want him to be. Amen? There's a lot of people trying to make God what they want him to be. And folks, we don't, God doesn't come to us on our level. We go to God on his level. And that's what he's trying to convince the Jewish people here. And that's what we're trying to convince people in this world today. You don't, you don't set the rules and God comes and gets in your box. God's done set the rules and you go to him and he shows you how to have righteousness forevermore. And then he ends up, he says, as it is written, see, I lay in Zion a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. Who's the stumbling block? It doesn't really fit really well for what we think of Jesus, but he's talking about Jesus, God's son. The stumbling block, the, the one that you've been hoping for, Jewish people, he's here. And guys, today in our world, there's people trying to find answers in all kinds of places. And the answer is in Jesus Christ. The answer is in Jesus Christ. And they're trying to put him, they're trying to find answers in this and that, and they're trying to change their world upside down and put answers in this and this and that. It's in Jesus and Jesus alone. So Paul takes him from that, and he continues that theme of righteousness right into chapter 10. And Israel's rejecting. They're rejecting the Savior. And here's the reasons that they've, they've rejected him. Let's read together in verses 1 through 13. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. Man, what, what a burden he had for his people. Guys, I pray in 2016, this will be one of our key verses. I pray, or I pray and I hope that our desire as a church is that people come to know Jesus as Savior. Both in your family, in the people you work with, in the people that we may go do mission work with in Arkansas, other states, maybe to the other side of the world, I don't know, we're exactly where God's going to lead us, but I know he's going to lead us there. And my heart's desire, and I hope your heart's desire, and I know it is, because I've been with you 11, almost 12 years now, and your desire is to see people come to know Jesus as Savior. And you know what? The years come and go, and we sing old Lang Syne year after year, and we, we toot our horns, you know, and Happy New Year and all that, but you know what? The, the, the project and the mission of the church never changes is to see people come to know Jesus as Savior. And that's not going to change. Well, don't you have something bigger and better and something, you know, don't you have some fireworks or something? Or, and guys, listen to me, there's nothing greater, there's nothing grander, there's nothing more big and explosive than for people to know Jesus Christ as Savior. Because it changes their whole life. And not only the life here, but it changes their eternity. And there's nothing that I know of that I can say that about besides Jesus and his love and his salvation is that if you'll accept this, it will not only change your life now, it will change your eternity. Think about that. It will change you forever. And there's not much you can say that about in this world. Probably not anything. Change you forever. And I still, we've talked about it many times, we still have a hard concept with this forever and ever, and we have a hard time accepting eternity because everything's bound by this. We're, we, we, we're on a time schedule all the time. But aren't you glad that our Savior's not on a time schedule? You know, he holds the world in his hands. When he says enough is enough, it'll be enough. And he says for us to do one thing, to be ready. And after you're ready, tell others. Tell others. And that's what Paul's saying here. What a powerful verse. Let me read it one more time. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God. They, 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 want, they, they are in fire for God. They were, man. They were, they were you know, I, I, we want to use the word Christian, but really they weren't believers yet. But they were religious. All right, let's use that word. They were religious. You know you could be religious and go to hell. You can. You can come sit here every Sunday. You can read your Bible every day and never accept Jesus as your Savior. It just works. Now, here's something I believe. The more you read this word, you're going to see what God's telling you. And it's going to be hard to read it day after day and not accept him 
It's kind of like I told you that I read the story last week with those, that, that, that Muslim college, and they ordered 25 Bibles in and said, hey, we want to use these Bibles in our class to show all these men how wrong Christianity is and how wrong the Bible is. And so they just start working their way through it. Nobody's in there leading them toward Christ. They're in there leading them away from Christ. And by the end of the class, they said six or seven or eight of the boys give their heart to Jesus. Think about that, just by reading the power of his word. Isn't that incredible? That's the power that we have in our hands. See, we've had this so long, and it's set there on the coffee table, if we got those anymore, that we used to have a coffee table in every house. Set there on the coffee table or on the, in the dash of our truck or, or it's in there by the bed and, and we, don't let it, we don't realize the power that is, is in this, this word. We've just been so accustomed to having it, it's just kind of like a, a good old comfortable shirt. But guys, there's power in the word of Jesus Christ. There's power in this book right here. And people can read it and their lives change and you don't have to tell them a word. That's amazing to me. That's amazing to me. Since they did not know the righteousness of God, righteousness of God, and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the culmination of the law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. When Christ came, what Paul's trying to tell his Israelite friends is, look, you've been looking and looking and praying and hoping and, and wishing for this Messiah, and he's here. Jesus Christ is a culmination. He's, he's what brought it all together. You've been, you've been slitting the throats of lambs for centuries and sprinkling it on the mercy seat. Well, now the perfect lamb has come, and he's died for your sins. He's took your sins and, and put them on his shoulders and went to an old rugged cross for you. He paid the price. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left the crimson stain, but he washes it white as snow. Whew! That's good. That's good. He can do that, guys. He's the culmination, and they're still looking. Just like the world today, they're still looking for an answer. We know the answer. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. Christ is the culmination of the law, so that we, there may be righteous for everyone who believes. Moses writes us about the righteous that is by the law. Now, what Paul's going kind of, to uh, do is he's going to take them right back to the Old Testament. Everything they know. Most of these guys have got this memorized. He said, look, let me show you here, and let me show you in this book, and in this book. He takes us through um, Isaiah there where we read about the, the, the stone. And he's going to take them through Leviticus and through many chapters in Deuteronomy. This is just kind of a repeat, these next few verses. But he's going to say, look, you know this. You've read this. You've memorized this. And it's smacking you right in the face, and you don't understand he's here. He's been here. He's paid the price. He's risen from the dead. Now all you have to do is accept him for your righteousness. Quit trying to earn it. Moses writes this in verse 5 about the righteousness that is by law. The person who does these things will live by them, but the righteousness that is by faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will ascend into the deep, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth. It is in your heart. That is the message concerning the faith that we proclaim. And here's, here's huge verses. If, you want, if somebody comes to you this week and says, how do I, how do I get saved? How do, how do I go to heaven? You just turn open to Romans 10, 9 and 10. If you've got a pen and you write in your Bible, underline these verses right here. Some of the greatest, simple verses, right up there with John 3, 16, I think. Look at it. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be, everybody say it, saved. Isn't that amazing? How simple is that? How complicated do we make it? We're just like the Israelites. They were trying to complicate it. They were saying, well, I've got to earn it. I've got to do all these things on this list of 600. I've got to take my goats and my lambs and my, my dove, and I've got to get them up there to the temple. Today we're saying things like, I gotta do this, and I gotta go to church, and I gotta teach Sunday school, or I gotta be a deacon, or I gotta sing in the choir, or I gotta sing up on the praise team, or or I gotta go on a mission field, and we, we try to think all this stuff is, is gonna earn us God's favor. 
And that's not how we attain righteousness. Now, that's good to come after. But how we attain righteousness is if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Now, you can't just say, Jesus is Lord, okay, I said it. What you're declaring when you say it is, I'm going to put him number one. He's on the top. He is who I'm surrendering my life to. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe he's God's son, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that it's not just a fairy tale. It's not just a made-up story in this book up there the preacher reads out of every Sunday, that he really did come back to life. You know, the Bible says over 500 people saw him alive. That's a lot of eyewitnesses. Today, if you get one good eyewitness, you can usually get a conviction. We had 500. 500 saw him alive, guys. Walking and talking. Our Savior is alive. He's alive. You will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. That's why, guys, I, I, know, I know coming up front scares you and coming down here to, to be saved, and you can be saved anywhere. All right, we've seen that before. We've seen people saved back in their chairs, back in my office, by the bedside, by grandma's rocking chair, in Sunday school class. But, but what, what really started this coming down front is that Christ just changed my life. And I believe who he is, and I want the whole world, or my little section of the world, or the people that I know, I want them to know how wonderful this is to know Jesus is Savior. I'm not ashamed of him. Guys, I tell you what, if, if our grandkids do something great, or our kids do something great, you're going to hear about it. I'm putting them on Facebook. You're going to see all of them in their glory, baby. Here's my kids, man. I'm proud of them, you know. You're going to see it. But guys, when it comes to Jesus, well, I don't know. I don't know. I'm a little shy. You know, folks, we believe with all our heart that, that baptism doesn't save you. We believe that it's a great, great part of, of this it's a beautiful part of obedience and I believe it's in our name okay so we we really like baptism but it's not what saves you but a lot of people say here's here's their question do I if I get saved do I have to be baptized do you know that the New Testament never deals with not being baptized I wonder why that is it's because of this when you receive something that great something that glorious and something that life-changing that's like nothing that's like oh that's all I got to do I'm doing it you know I want to do it it is a great thing don't get me wrong I'm not trying to trivialize but what I'm saying is we we sit there scared to death of something and that that's small he doesn't say get up on the cross and and take a nail in one hand he doesn't say I want to drive a spear through your feet or I want to stab you in the side then you can be saved what did he say he said Believe with me in all your heart, confess me with your mouth, and then after you're saved, I'd like you to follow in believer's baptism. Hmm. That seems so hard. No, it don't, does it? That's why he never dealt with it. He just thought people would want to say, that's what I want to do. And listen, I understand sickness and, and things like that kind of keep some people from being baptized. The Lord understands that. But I'm telling you, if you're walking and jumping and talking, and you give your heart to Jesus, you want to, you want to run through the water to show the world that you have Jesus Christ in your heart. It should be a thing you want to do out of obedience. And that's what he's talking. He said, the men that are rejecting, they're making it hard. Profess in your faith and you are saved. Verse 11, the scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. Isn't that something? And guys, right now, our country is witnessing things over with this ISIS group and things, we're witnessing things where people are being beheaded for the cause of Christ. People are losing arms and uh, all kind of just, just awful things to even think about. And you go, man, that's a shame. But what did we just read here? As the scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. Oh, I don't know. I don't know, Brother Todd. I, 
You know, I go to school. I'm pretty popular out there at Rivercrest. If I go in there and tell them I'm a Christian, they're going to probably laugh at me. You know what the Bible says? You will never be put to shame. Well, I'm in college now, Brother Todd. You know, college is a different world. You know, some of them professors, they don't even believe in God. I'm not going to go in there and, and, you know, I'm not going to be making a big deal about my Christianity. Those that believe in Christ will never be put to shame. He stood up for you. Don't you think we ought to stand up for him? Hmm. Guys, listen. The more I see the direction we're going, and guys, I don't know the future, but the more I see the direction of our country and the way we are going as human beings, we're in for a rough ride. I heard someone the other day, I don't know where it was a movie or a video or something. I think Jeff had something playing, and it said, you know, we pray, God, shake us, shake us easy. But you know what? God's been shaking us easy for a long time. And we haven't listened. And I'm afraid he's about to shake us hard. Because we're not going to listen any other way. Guys, there may be days very close, very soon, where we're going to have to stand up for who we believe in. And we're going to have to say it out loud. And I pray that I have enough faith to do that. I'm serious. You see these people that are dealing with ISIS, and they're, they're taking their kids, and they're saying, deny Christ and follow Muslim or I'm going to cut your kids' arms off. Guys, listen to me. We get all fired up when the coach don't play our kid on peewee football, you know? And they're about to take one of our kids' arms off. And I've got to sit there and say, I will not deny my Lord. Whack. All right. You want to go for two? Or you want to deny Christ? I will not deny my Lord. Guys, I pray I'm ready for that. I don't know what we're going to face. But I know our brothers and sisters are facing that just around the world a little ways. And I know it could come home. Oh, Brother Todd, that's never going to happen in America. What have you seen happen in America the last 10 years that you said that'll never happen in America? Amen? Amen? And guys, I don't want to be Debbie Downer on New Year's Day, first Sunday, you know? But I want us to dig in, and I want us to be ready. Because he said already he's never going to be ashamed of us. And I certainly don't want to be ashamed of him. And it's one thing to type it out and well, I'll never be ashamed of Christ. But guys, every one of us need to pray for ourselves and pray for each other that we'll be strong enough and faithful enough if it ever comes our way. Because I love my kids, and I know you do too. I don't know what we're going to face. But I think more than any time in my life, I think we better be prepared. Because I don't know. But I do know that God is faithful, amen? And he will take care of us. We'll see our way through. And the Bible says, don't fear those that can hurt the body. But fear those that can take away the soul or hurt the soul. Or the devil can convince you that you don't need God and you walk away. That's pretty heavy stuff on January 3rd, 2016. But I've been thinking about that a lot. And I worry, I worry. But what's he been saying since the beginning of time? Trust me. Trust me. And that's what we must do. That's what we must do. Verse 12, for there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. You hear that? He richly blesses all that uh, give $5 so they get $30 back? No. He richly blesses all those that, you know, Go out and give all their money away? No, he says, what does he say? How does he bless? 
Guys, this is not a, this is not a give and get thing, all right? How does it, what does it say there? The same Lord is Lord of all who richly blesses all who call on him. You want blessings from the Lord? You don't have to forward a chain letter. You don't have to forward a picture of money. You don't have to do all those crazy things that people are doing nowadays. You just call upon the name of the Lord. He'll bless you. Now, I'm not saying you'll be rich. I'm not saying you're going to drive Cadillacs or, or a private jet. But I'm saying he will be, he'll be watching. He will stay faithful. And someday when it's all said and done and the books are closed, you're going to live in eternity with Jesus Christ. Don't get much better than that, guys. Doesn't get much better than that. Verse 13, for everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. <laughs> That's as straightforward as it gets. For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Are you saved this morning? Brother Todd, you ask that every Sunday. I'm going to keep asking it, all right? Because we got to know. We got to know. And you don't have to doubt. I'm not here to make you doubt. I'm just saying, do you know? Have you called upon the name of the Lord? So you don't, you don't get Lord just by kind of oozing into it and, and sitting here every day and it just kind of absorbs into you like osmosis. We used to study in school. I think that's the right word. It's been a while. Very, thank you, thank you. But, but we, have to, we have to trust him. We have to call out. We've, we've, seen the, we've seen the formula today. Call upon the name of the Lord. Pro profess him with your mouth. Put him number one in your life. And everyone that calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And, and that's S-A-V-E-D, all right? That's past tense. You're his. He's not going to give it and take it. it. It's yours. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. We can know. You don't have to doubt. You don't have to wonder. You don't have to guess. You don't have to hope so. You can know so. Not because we're great people and I preach it so good like you've never heard it before, but because we serve a God that does not lie. Because we serve a God that will not, will not take it away from you. We serve a God that loves you and he keeps his promises. And the saving is not by us and not by this church, but it's by the precious grip and grace of Jesus Christ. That's why I can be so adamant about it. That's why I can shout it out and say, you can know. It's not because this is a great church. Yeah, I, I'm glad to be a part of this church. This is not what saves you. It's the precious blood and the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And someday we'll stand before the Father, and he won't look at me and say, what a great job you did, Todd Vinson. He's going to say, because of my son, well done, and welcome home. That's, why he's gonna, that's what he's going to say. Not because I'm a great guy. It's because I know a great father, and I know a savior that will save us and love us. That's why we're going to be there. This is, not, this is not rocket science. It's not the most difficult thing in the world. He said, just cry out to me, and I'm going to wrap my arms around you and love you. He told him that in the prodigal son. Jesus would, he was trying to talk to him about the Israelites. You know, the older son, he wasn't happy. He wasn't happy. Men are throwing a party, and I've stayed here, and... I've been faithful, and I didn't run off and leave you, Dad. I didn't take all your money and take off to other worlds and countries. And Look at me. You know who that son was? That was the Jewish people. He's trying to tell them. This old prodigal, that's the Gentiles. They, they believed, even though they were rotten to the core, they believed. And you guys think just because of who you are, you're going to get entrance into heaven. He said, no. You still got to go through Jesus Christ, my son. That's what he was trying to tell him. That's what he tried to tell him in the rich Pharisee. Pharisee walks in the church. Oh, Lord, I'm so glad I'm not like that guy. Boy, heaven forbid we pray like that when we come in here. Man, I'm so glad I'm not like him. And over here is a Gentile, and he's going, Lord, just have mercy on me. I'm a rotten, no good sinner. That's what it is. 
You go, well, that kind of defames you, doesn't it? That kind of kicks your guts out. That kind of, do we have to sit around and think how bad we are all the time? No, because we're something in Jesus Christ. He makes something beautiful out of our life. We're something through him. But we need to realize what we were before him, and we appreciate that a lot more. When my little girls don't have a bicycle, and then they got a bicycle, they appreciate the bicycle more. They didn't have an easy bake oven before Christmas. They got one now. We made a cake the other day. I appreciated that cake. All right? You know what I mean? They appreciate what they didn't have. Guys, when we look at our life and what we were before Christ and what we are now in him, that's a good thing. That's better than an easy bake oven. That's how much he loved. That's how much he loved. That's how much he loved his people, guys. You can see Paul almost with tears in his eyes. My desire for you is to be saved. Paul loved his people, just like you love your families, like you love your people you work with and people around you, your desire for them. Guys, we are to be shedding tears for our country and for the people that we love because when it's over, it's over. And that's the kind of burden I want us to have in 2016, fresh and anew that our thought is always about where's someone I can talk to. With those ears alert to those signals. I don't really believe in this Jesus stuff. Do you? Woo-hoo. Open door. Begin to tell him, man. Yes, I do. Let me tell you what he's done in my life. I don't think church is all that important. Do you? Guys, when you hear a do you question, you jump on that, all right? You tell them, you tell them in love how much God wants to change their lives. I better quit. It's getting late. I get all fired up about God. And he loves you. And don't, don't leave here today not knowing him, guys. You can sit right there where you're at and confess him as Savior. But then my prayer is that you'll be so excited about what he's done in your life, you're going to want to tell someone. Tell me or your family or somebody you work with. And start out 2016 the best way possible. And maybe you've been a little cold and you're a believer and you know Christ, but you've been a little cold and kind of been out watching through the window and not really in here with the rest of us. Just say, Lord, I want to just rededicate my life in 2016. I want to start right now. I want to get fired up about telling people about Jesus because there's not much longer to live. I was at a basketball game tonight with Steve Kirk. And we was on the highest row that you could possibly go in the FedEx Forum. And me and Steve were going like this, you know, getting up there. Gary looked like two 100-year-old guys, you know. And we got up there and we, <gasps> you know, we was just, and then I wouldn't go down for refreshments or anything because it's too far back up. And, and so when we walked down, we were holding on to that rail, you know. And he said, man, we look like two old guys. I said, that's exactly what we are. I said, Steve, do you realize that in 15 years I'm going to be 70 years old? And it just kind of hit me. I know some of you other guys are going, oh, you're just a young pup. I understand that. But I, I'm just kind of coming to terms with my mortality. In 15 years, I'm going to be 70 years old. Guys, the days are growing short. Now, some of you younger guys, you cherish them, all right? But us older folks... If we got somebody we love or somebody we need to tell about Jesus, we need to do it now. We need to do it quick. Because you know how fast this last ten went. This next ten is going to be about five. And guys, I want us to be on guard. I want us to be on task. I want us to be about the Father's business. Are you ready? Are you ready? All right, let's pray. And Father, we come to you today, Lord, and we just want to be about your business. Lord, I love the passion that Paul had for his people. Lord, he just had a desire and a longing in his heart for them to know you. Lord, I want us to have that same desire. Lord, I want to have that desire. Lord, I thank you for these people. I thank you for this, this wonderful membership here. and Thank you for all of our guests and all the folks that are just a part of us, Lord. It's just great to be together today. But Lord, help us to have a sense of urgency in 2016. Help us to be grounded in you in faith. 
And Lord, I pray if there's someone in this room today, I pray that they would start 2016 off knowing you as Savior if they don't right now. Lord, it's as simple as them just saying, Lord, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died for me. I believe you paid my price on the cross. And I believe you rose again and defeated death so that someday I could defeat death through your mighty righteousness. And Lord, I know through you I can be righteous, not because of what I've done, but because of what you've done. And today I give you my life to be the Lord of my life. And I confess you with my mouth that you are Lord and Savior. And Lord, they can, they can begin that road of salvation. They, they'll be saved and they can begin to learn more about you and begin to tell friends and family about you also. Lord, for us that have been here and we know Christ as Savior, Lord, maybe we've been a little cold or maybe we've been kind of out in the back somewhere, not really involved. I pray that we would recommit ourselves in 2016 to be more involved in church and find us a spot somewhere in here that we like and, and get busy. Lord, there's going to be lots of opportunities in lots of different places this year. I pray that we will all be busy about your business. Lord, whatever it is, just speak to hearts this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining us today. If you have prayer requests, need to contact us, or need directions to the church, check us out online at fbckaiser.com. If you want to join us, we're located at 210 East Main Street, or give us a call at 870-526-2604 or send mail to P.O. Box 306, Kaiser, Arkansas, 72351. We'd love to see you soon. Thanks again for joining us, and may God bless you.